Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we've got another college football DFS preview and pick show. Today, we are talking the week eight main slate, the noon Eastern time slate on Saturday, October 21st, 2023. We're going to be breaking down the games that you want to target and get guys into your lineups for. We're going to be breaking down the best plays at quarterback, running back, and wide receiver, all long talking lineup construction, ownership, um, predictions, projections, situations to monitor, injuries to monitor, um, and stuff like that. So pretty much we've got you covered with everything here on this show to help you guys get all the information you need and win some money on the week eight main slate of college football DFS. Now, if you're watching on YouTube, Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. You'll be notified when all new episodes drop, like all of our weekly college football, NFL, and golf content. And if you are listening on the audio feed, you can subscribe as well. You'll still be notified when all episodes drop. And hit that like button. It really helps me out a lot. It helps the videos get noticed, and I really do appreciate it. All right, let's go ahead now and dive into the analysis with um, looking at the slate and looking at some games that we might want to target for our lives. All right, y'all. So looking at the slate as a whole, this is just not exactly – like the most appetizing slate for DFS. There's just not a whole lot of games out there that are really projected to be high scoring or really stackable for DFS purposes. It's not that those games aren't available. They're just, for some reason, DraftKings didn't choose to put them on there. Like Boston College, Georgia Tech is kind of an ugly game, but um, a lot of good players on those two teams that are very stackable, very um worth playing in DFS. Missouri, South Carolina is another one that for some reason didn't make the DraftKings main slate. But anyway, it is what it is. But it's just there's not a whole lot of games that are really juicy that I really see as worthy of creating lineups where you're looking at a game stack for this week. So there are a few projected blowouts. There are three teams this week that are projected to get to 40 points. Um, and the first one is going to be Oklahoma. Oklahoma is taking on Central Florida. They're 18 and a half point favorites, total of 65 and a half. Now that's actually gone up one since when I initially did my research. So this total is projected to be about uh, 42 to 23 in favor of the Sooners. If you think Central Florida can keep this one close, this is a very game stackable game. Um, however, Oklahoma really impressed me when they when they beat Texas. Um, I was not really uh, drinking the Kool Aid on Oklahoma prior to when they beat Texas for obvious reasons, but I was really impressed with them, and I think their defense is better than they get credit for. And I kind of don't see Central Florida keeping this one very close. However, it's a very stackable game if you do think that Central Florida can push them a little bit. Another projected blowout is going to be Washington State at Oregon. Um, Oregon's 18.5 point favorites, total is 62.5. So it's projected to be in favor of Oregon about 40 to 22. Um, Washington State looked real bad last week against Arizona. Um, Oregon looking for a little bit of a bounce back game after the loss to Washington. Again, this is another one where if you think this game gets pushed, it's very stackable, but I can very well see this being a, a big time blowout for the Ducks. Another blowout is going to be the last game that made the main slate on DraftKings, Texas at Houston. Texas is 22 and a half point favorites. Total is 60.5, so it's projected to be about 41 to 19. And again, same thing as the first few blowouts, y'all. If you think Houston pushes this game, then it's very stackable. I don't think Houston pushes this game. I think Texas is going to be able to dominate the line of scrimmage. I think they're going to be able to get that ground game going. And I do think this one is going to be a romp. Um, now, there are two projected shootouts. Remember, when I, I use the word shootout, I'm talking a total of uh, about 50 or above, and then I want it to be a one possession game. These are the games that are the most stackable in DFS purposes. Um, so the first projected shootout, if I can find it here on uh, FanDuel Sportsbook, is going to be Oklahoma State at West Virginia. So Oklahoma State at West Virginia, total of 49 and a half in this one. There it is. They didn't have the logos. So total of 49 and a half in this one, and uh, West Virginia's three and a half point favorites. So it's projected to be about 26 to 23. Um, this game was only 24 to 19 last year, but I think you're looking at improved quarterback play for West Virginia with Garrett Green. Oklahoma State's finally settled into their offense that's kind of a little bit more ground heavy than it has been in years past. But you definitely got some guys in this game that are worth playing, and I can definitely see this one going back and forth. However, the best shootout on the board to me is one that's a little bit under the radar, Memphis at UAB. Memphis is five and a half point favorites, total is 63 and a half. So it's projected to be about 34 to 29 in favor of Memphis. So if you're looking to construct a game stack lineup for this Saturday's main slate, Memphis at UAB is probably the, the most trustworthy one you can go where you're going to get a high scoring game, but also a close game. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the plays at each position now. So let's go ahead and talk about quarterback. At the top of the board sits our guy, Bo Nix, who no surprise when he's at the top of the board in DFS. He's been 
pretty much great ever since he put on an Oregon Ducks uniform. Feels like he's been in college for about eight years, but hey, he's only been in Oregon for two, and he's been great both of them. Now, we are still awaiting a big-time ceiling game from Bo Nix. Every single one of Bo Nix's games this season have been in between 23 and 31 fantasy points. He hasn't topped 31. Um, and so, to me, if he has a ceiling, like, I kind of want to be on him when he has a ceiling game, right? And I think there's a big potential for it this week taking on Washington State, who just gave up 44 points to Arizona. And I think Oregon's offense is a lot better than Arizona. How Bo Nix gets to that ceiling game, though, is going to be finding some rushing upside. He has only rushed for one touchdown so far this year, and pretty much last year, he was averaging almost a touchdown per game on the ground. So if Bo Nix finally starts to use his legs a little bit, that would be how we would get like a big-time 35-40 point ceiling game out of Bo Nix. I think he's a very safe option in cash, and in GPP, I think he's a solid option, but we're going to need him to start running the football or scoring rushing touchdowns if we want him to hit his true ceiling. Now, Dylan Gabriel is the quarterback on the slate who has had the safest floor so far in the 2023 season. He has not scored um, a game fewer than 25 fantasy points this season, which is pretty darn impressive. And I really thought that Dylan Gabriel um, was very touchdown dependent early on in the season. And he's kind of not been that over the last few weeks. I mean, yes, he's still been able to get rushing touchdowns in each of the last three weeks, but the passing numbers have dried up just a little bit in the touchdown department, and he's still been pretty solid. Now, another good sign for Dylan Gabriel as we look towards the end of the season is that when Oklahoma finally played a close game against Texas, Dylan Gabriel ran the ball more. He set a season high with 14 rushing attempts. So if Oklahoma is going to get pushed, means that Dylan Gabriel is going to run more. That makes him even more appetizing if you're looking to build a game stack for this game or any other game in the future, because rushing upside is how we get quarterbacks to hit their ceiling games. Now, Cam Ward is third on the list, and i got to be honest, he's an interesting bring back um, for the Washington State side. Uh, you know, going up against Oregon. If you want to play Knicks and Ward together, I think it is possible. I think there's enough salary savers out there that you can do that. But Cam Ward's been objectively bad each of the last two weeks. Hasn't topped nine fantasy points in each of the last two weeks. And this was after having two 40-plus fantasy point performances earlier on in the season. So very volatile player with Cam Ward. I'm interested in him with a game stack, but not as an individual play just because – I think there's a whole lot of volatility there, and we've seen Oregon's defense make some good quarterbacks look bad like they did at Colorado. So um, probably just a game stack only play for me is Cam Ward. Now, Quinn Ewers is a guy that I love as a Texas fan. He's been playing really well as a Texas fan, but I think he's overpriced in DFS right now. $8,600 for a guy that is in an offense that is clearly run first and I just don't think that that's a great price point for him. So if you're looking to play him um, against Houston, you're going to need one of three things to happen. One, you're going to need deep, deep touchdowns because that's one way that you can rack up fancy points as a quarterback quickly. Two, you would need Quinn Ewers to run the football and score running the football, which he's done. He has four rushing touchdowns so far this season. Or three, you would need this game to turn into a shootout where both teams are just going up and down the field scoring like a pinball machine. Um, I don't necessarily think either of those three things are likely. So Quinn Ewers, as much as I love him, he's probably a pass for me this week. Jalen Milrow is a guy that I do like, though. Jalen Milrow is like a very safe cash game quarterback right now. Each of the last three games since he settled back into the starting role, he scored in between 21 and 25 fantasy points, and he really hasn't had a game where he's hit both his passing upside and his rushing upside in the same game. And so when he does finally get that, he's going to have a big-time, big-time performance. And against Tennessee, this is a pretty good spot for him. Tennessee's not a great defense. Alabama's implied 28 points in this game. So if Jalen Milrow is involved in three or four touchdowns, you're going to get a pretty solid outing out of Jalen Milrow. I really do like to play with Jalen Milrow this week. Now, we mentioned the juicy Memphis and UAB game. Well, Seth Hennigan is one of the most vital pieces of that game. The last game out against Tulane, he had 25 fantasy points, and that is significant for two reasons. One, Tulane's one of the best defenses in the American Athletic. So if you can put up 25 fantasy points against that defense, you're going to be in pretty good shape for the rest of your conference play. Two, he attempted 43 passes, which was his second highest number of attempts on the year. Why is that relevant, though? Well, Blake Watson, Memphis's running back, who is a workhorse, who is used in the passing game, who is very good at football, left the game early and is questionable for this Saturday at UAB. 
Memphis clearly showed in this game against Tulane that if Blake Watson is down, Blake or if Blake Watson is out of the game, they're going to throw the football all over the yard with, with that 43 attempts number for Seth Hennigan. So if Blake Watson is in fact out, I think that just funnels more of their production to Seth Hennigan. And I really do like the play in what is probably the most juiciest game of the slate. Now, looking down, there's not a whole lot of other guys that really intrigue me further down the board. There's a few game stack pieces that, if you think their team keeps it close, are in play, like Donovan Smith of Houston or John Reese Plumley of UCF. If you think their team keeps it close, then, then I do like them, but I, I just don't think that's super-duper likely. Garrett Green of West Virginia is a guy that I like a lot. Um, he has had a pretty safe floor this year. He scored over 21 fantasy points in every game that he has finished. I don't know why he is priced down here in the 7K range on DraftKings. I really don't. He showed a ceiling of 44 fantasy points last game against Houston. So you're looking at a guy who has a ceiling on par with the other top quarterbacks on the slate, who has a floor on par with other top quarterbacks on the slate, and he's priced down two grand less than them in a game that has a total of 49 and a half in West Virginia is favored. This is a really, really good spot for Garrett Green. He does love to run the football from the quarterback position as well, which we love in DFS. So Garrett Green is going to be one of my favorite plays this week as I'm sitting down here recording this on Wednesday morning. Joe Milton is a guy that is um, super duper volatile. Um, you don't really know what you're going to get from him in terms of um, the passing upside or the rushing upside. He, he did not look great against Texas A&M. Um, he's had one big game rushing the football, and it was because of one long run. Um, so I don't necessarily think Joe Milton is in play for me taking on an Alabama defense, but I did want to mention him because, um, you know, it, that is a pretty pretty noteworthy game, Tennessee at Alabama. Now, just a few more quarterbacks to talk about before we switch over. K.J. Jefferson um, was actually not bad against Alabama, 18.6 fantasy points, but I think that this game against Mississippi State is a really, really good spot for him. Arkansas six and a half point favorites in this game. They're implied 27 points. So if you get three or four touchdowns out of K.J. Jefferson, especially if one of them is running the football, um, that could be a ceiling game for K.J. Jefferson. And looking at it, he has one rushing touchdown so far this season, and that's just not what – was the case last year. Uh, you know, kind of like with Bo Nix, last year KJ Jefferson's upside was in rushing, and he seemed to score almost a rushing touchdown every game. So um, if we do get a rushing upside game out of KJ Jefferson, that could be a pretty big day for him. Kyle McCord is finally priced down um, according to where I think he should be from what his production has been. But I really don't like the matchup against Penn State. I don't see this being a super high scoring game. So he is probably a pass in my book. Jacob Zeno, the UAB quarterback, is down here in the 7K range, intriguing as a game stacking option against Memphis. Um, but there's not a whole lot of cheap options at quarterback that are appealing to me. So one of them that is, though, is going to be Curtis Rourke of Ohio. So Curtis Rourke is a guy that I can get behind. He was much better last year in conference play than out of conference play. And guess what? We're finally in MAC conference play. Ohio is one of the best teams in the MAC. They're going to be winning a lot of these games. They're going to be scoring a lot of points in these games. And Rourke has flashed his ceiling with a 35 fantasy point performance against Kent State. He's a guy that if you want to go expensive quarterback, cheap quarterback, he is a cheap quarterback option for that. And then also, um, Air Force, their quarterback, Zach Larrier, is listed as out of this game, um, which opens up the door for Jensen Jones at $5,400 to likely be the starter. They haven't named a starter yet, but given that Jensen is the only other one who's taken a snap so far this season, I would tend to think that it's him. But we know that Air Force runs this triple option offense, um, which is very, very good for a rushing quarterback. Um, pretty much that's how he's going to have to score all of his points, but it can be very, very lucrative from a DFS perspective. All right, so let's go ahead and switch gears and talk about some running back plays. All right, so if you were watching and listening to this and thinking, well, all this information is great, but who actually makes the cut for my lineups? Well, there are a few places you can find me. You can follow me on X at Mike's Money Picks. I always tweet out the DFS rundown for every college football slate where I just go over some of my favorite kind of categories for that slate. Um, and I'll answer any questions over there um, at Mike's Money Picks. If there's any injury situations that are worth monitoring or updating on, I usually tweet about them as well. Um, I'm also in the Fantasy Corner Discord. Link is in the description on YouTube. We got a lot of smart people in there who play a lot of DFS for a lot of different sports, um, college uh, college football, NFL, NBA, MLB. Just it's, We all got it covered in there. It's a lot of very smart, very good people bouncing ideas off each other in there. 
And also, I do write full-length articles for every college football DFS slate, as well as every NFL and golf slate, but I do not write for free. For a very reasonable price of $3 a month, you can read all these articles at patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. I break down my core plays for every slate um, with reasoning why, and I also talk about ownership and lineup construction, just some strategies for trying to get better at DFS in there on uh, those articles. Also, if you're looking for any new action this college football season, um, uh, head on over to my site at signupexpert.com slash Mike's Mike's Picks. We're partnering with Signup Expert, and what they do is they give you the best offers and promo codes for new users on any DFS player props and sports book site, and it'll sync to your area, so it'll only show you what's available in your state or province. Um, and so, basically, by by signing up through there, you're not only getting the best offer and promo code for yourself, but you're also showing me some support by using my links as well. So, if you're looking to try a new site this year, head on over to signupexpert.com/slash Mike's Picks. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the running backs now. So, the top running back on the board is a guy that I was pretty harsh on um, each of the last two weeks. It's Braylon Allen of Wisconsin. And he's got a solid matchup against Illinois, a team that has not appeared to be able to stop the run. Um, And also what I like about Braylon Allen this week is his price tag's gone down a little bit. He's not in the 8Ks anymore. He's back to 7,700. And he doesn't appear to be in a committee anymore. Um, Acker, the guy who was kind of stealing carries from him, the when at, right after Shez Malusi got hurt, it was not much of a factor in Wisconsin's last game. So Braylon Allen is pretty much an 80-20 back right now, looking like more of a workhorse in a good matchup at a solid price tag. I really do like the play with Braylon Allen, and I think there's enough salary savers at wide receiver and quarterback that you can fit him into line. Bucky Irving to me is primarily a leverage play. Look, he's been really good this season, but to me, the leverage on playing Bucky Irving would be if you play Bucky Irving and he has a big time, big time game, it's probably going to come at the expense of Bo Nix not having one. So the best time to play Bucky Irving is when everybody is playing Bo Nix. Um, last week, they just so happened to both get there with, with Bucky Irving having 31 fancy points and Bo Nix having, I believe, 27 because Bucky Irving got his 100 yard bonus on DraftKings. He scored a touchdown and he caught six passes as well. So they were both able to get home against Washington, but that's not always the case. So uh, to me, Bucky Irving makes a lot of sense as a leverage play, but he's been pretty good in his own right. And I definitely think that that's worth acknowledging as well. But I really do like the angle of you're getting leverage on everybody who plays Bo Nix if you have Bucky Irving in your lineup. However, the guy that I'm most likely to play in this uh, little group right here at the top is Jonathan Brooks of Texas. So he's in, in an absolute smash spot against Houston, a team that struggled to stop the run in their last game against West Virginia. Texas is going to be bigger and stronger and better at the line of scrimmage on the offensive and defensive lines than Houston. So I think Texas will be able to control this game and control the clock in this game. Um, and you're looking at a guy in Jonathan Brooks in his last four games is averaging um over 20 carries a game, and he's also been over 19 fantasy points in each of those four games as well. He's got 100 yards in each of those four games as well, which is super important on DraftKings. So Jonathan Brooks, absolute smash play. Now, if you think that Texas ends up just blowing this game out and it ends up being just a total bloodbath, which is a possibility, um, C.J. Baxter would be in play then. He's a guy that is a freshman, super talented. They're calling him the next Bijan Robinson um, at Texas, but in games that have been kind of lopsided, He's been pretty good. He got a double-digit fantasy points against Kansas and Baylor. Um, and if he finds the end zone late, then a salary of only $4,500, that's going to be a pretty solid play. So um, definitely an interesting angle if you think that game turns into a blowout to play C.J. Baxter. Blake Watson of Memphis is questionable. Um, we've kind of got enough information from their last game to assume that it would be Sutton Smith, who is the guy that would be in the backfield if Blake Watson were to miss time. Um, and that's just such a lucrative role with how much they use Blake Watson and how much they use him in the passing game. So if Blake Watson does indeed miss, Sutton Smith is probably going to be like an absolute very chalky, very easy click at only $4,000. Ollie Gordon is another one of my favorite plays on the slate. So Oklahoma State, Mike Gundy is just a very good offensive coach, right? And he's kind of acknowledged this year that, hey, I don't have an elite quarterback. How can I help out my elite quarterback? By giving the ball to my very talented, very good running back in Ollie Gordon. So Ollie Gordon has basically gotten um, 18 carries or more in each of the last three games. He's gotten over 120 yards in each of the last three games. 
and he's just been really solid. You know, peaking with a 52 fantasy point performance against Kansas, where he hit the 100 yard rushing and 100 yard receiving bonus because they will use him in the passing game. I think he has the highest ceiling of any back on the slate in a good matchup against West Virginia and a guy that is for sure to get at least 20 touches. Ollie Gordon, an absolute smash play as well. If you force me to pick one from this group, I would probably order it Gordon and then Brooks and then Allen at the very top of the board. Now, from there, looking further down the board, you've got the Jaquavius Marks and Travion Henderson questionable tags. Look, Ohio State was an absolute mess at running back last week. We thought it was going to be uh, Trainum that ended up getting a lot of the carries, and he ends up getting hurt, and so it ends up being Dow and Hayden. Mayan Williams is like a wall. We don't know what happened to him. And so this is just an absolute mess. If Travion Henderson plays, I think it clarifies it a little bit because he will be the primary back. But if he doesn't play, it's a mess. And either way, it's a matchup I don't want to touch against Penn State. There's much better plays on the board. However, the one thing I will say, though, and I say this about DFS a lot, sometimes bad plays become good plays when nobody plays them. And so Travion Henderson does have a legitimate ceiling. If he is active, he's going to be like super lowly owned. He might be worth a shot in a GPP, but he's not a guy I'm going to be eager to click on. And Mississippi State runs a lot of their offense through Jaquavius Marks. So if he is, in fact, questionable, if he does miss, there will be – um you know, a chance that, you know, somebody could be stepping into that role, but I don't think he ends up missing. I think he does end up starting this game. CJ Donaldson of West Virginia, as well as um, RJ Harvey of UCF are not bad plays at all. Um, they're both in games that could feature a lot of high scoring, a lot of high scoring, uh, a lot of points to be scored. It's early in the morning, y'all. And they're also in, you know, kind of workhorse situations where nobody's really taking carries from them in um, run heavy offenses. So even though their teams are not exactly in the best spot in these games, I definitely think they are playable um, for me. Jermaine Brown Jr. is my favorite play in the 6K range, though. So um, UAB's backup running back, I believe Isaiah Jacobs is his name. Um, he ended up getting out for the season with an injury. And since then, Jermaine Brown Jr. has been really, really good. Um, he's seen at least double-digit carries in all three games. He's gotten 15 fantasy points in all three games, with two of them being above 30, one of them peaking at 42. So Jermaine Brown Jr., high ceiling, high floor, really solid play in a really good game environment as well. I think when you're looking at how you can play this game, I think you can go Hennigan at quarterback for Memphis, Brown at running back for UAB, get yourself one or two receivers from it, and then you can even play quarterback from one of the other games on the slate as opposed to just you know playing a Memphis quarterback and a UAB quarterback. Because I think if UAB scores a lot of points in this game, it's going to be because of Jermaine Brown Jr. Now, another guy that I absolutely love this week is Emmanuel Michelle of Air Force. So he is the new B-back um, for Air Force, which means that when they run triple option, he is the dive guy. And as a guy who was in college football for four years, working in film at UNC Charlotte, watches a lot of college football, loves triple option football, this is a super lucrative role for fantasy because a lot of teams' easiest answer to defending the triple option is to just make them give it to the dive and then just hope you can tackle the dive for less than five yards. And so he is the guy who's going to be getting a lot of touches, a lot of carries. As you can see by his game lock, he's been over 18 carries in each of the last four. He's had two 30 fantasy point performances. Emmanuel Michelle in a super lucrative spot, very solid play at only $5,800. Rocket Sanders of Arkansas, was a surprise scratch last Saturday against Alabama. Uh, if he ends up playing, I, I do like him. Um, we remember him from last year. He was really good for the Razorbacks, and this is a game where they're favored against the Mississippi State team that's not great on defense. If he sits, A.J. Green and uh, Rashad Dubinian will kind of split the carries, but if Rocket Sanders ends up playing, I really do like him as a play at only $5,500. Nakia Watson of Washington State is another guy I'm interested in because he appears to be game script proof. Um, he's had some duds and he's had some good games so far this year, but the game script hasn't really determined that because he's a back that may not get a whole lot of carries as a conventional ring back in the backfield, but he does catch a lot of passes out of the backfield. So he's a guy that even though Washington State may end up getting boat raced in this game, he's a guy that can still get you some fancy points as well because of that pass catching upside. 
And the last guy that I'm going to talk about, um, y'all, bargain running backs is kind of tough this week. Um, you know, you've got the injury situations that you can take advantage of. You've got, you know, a guy in a blowout like C.J. Baxter. But a guy that's kind of cheap that could end up being a workhorse is Caden Fagan of Illinois. Um, if Reggie Love and Josh McCray end up missing this game, Caden Fagan will be the workhorse back, which he was against Maryland, and he took advantage for 17 fantasy points. So keep an eye on those two injuries because if Fagan is the workhorse again, he's in a pretty good spot. Even though the Wisconsin run defense is pretty tough, I'll take a guy down there in the 4K range who's going to be guaranteed to get about 20 touches. All right, that does it for the running back position. So let's take a quick breather and close it out by talking wide receivers. All right, so let's go ahead and break down the wide receiver position. And we're going to kind of do the same thing that we do always here. We're going to talk about kind of some receiver rooms that you can look to um, maybe stack or maybe compare and contrast. And then we're going to look at some one-off plays that you can put into your lineups um, from there. So the first team we got to talk about, the, the, the receiver at the top of the board is Marvin Harrison Jr. And look, I think the Ohio State Buckeyes receiving room for me is Marvison Harrison Jr., Marvin Harrison Jr. or bust. He has just been really good. Like, he's just a really good player. His one down game was a game against Indiana, the season opener, and then against Notre Dame where he left early and was being shadowed by Benjamin Morrison, who turns out if you watch the Notre Dame-USC game, he's pretty good at football. So um, I definitely think Marvin Harrison Jr. is in a pretty good spot. Even with the tough matchup, I don't care. He's going to see probably 10 targets. He's probably going to score a touchdown as well. Omega Buka is questionable for this game, and last week we really didn't see any wide receivers step up their production big time without Ibuka in the lineup. The biggest beneficiary was actually Cade Stover, who had 21 fantasy points, and in fact, he's been double-digit fantasy points in every game so far this season. Uh, the other guy who saw a little bit of a benefit was Carnell Tate, um, who ended up with 10 fantasy points against Purdue, three receptions for 79 yards. Most of that was on one big play. And then Xavier Johnson was used a little bit as well, ended up with seven fantasy points in that game, had a little bit of carries at the backfield as well. So it's kind of a mess for this Ohio State receiver room. Even if Ibuka plays or doesn't, I, I'm not really interested in anybody else not named Marvin Harrison Jr. I think if you're looking to super stack the game, I think Cade Stover would probably be my second favorite option. Now, on the Penn State side of things, Keandre Lambert-Smith has shown a high ceiling. Um, you know, he's had a 30 fantasy point performance this season. He is their leader in targets, but I don't necessarily think he's got a great chance to hit his ceiling against the Buckeyes. So I think if you're stacking this game, which would be super unconventional, he's certainly the guy I would use, but probably a situation just to avoid in general. Now, Oregon is another team that we got to talk about because they have Troy Franklin, who I think is also one of the best wide receiver plays on the slate. He is the primary stack partner with Bo Nix. Um, he's been over 30 fantasy points in each of the last three games. He scored five touchdowns over the last three games. He's got his 100-yard bonus over the last three games. He checks a lot of boxes. And if you're playing Bo Nix, you got to play him with Troy Franklin. If you're looking to be a little bit different, I think Tez Johnson isn't option. He ended up with seven catches for 71 yards against Washington um, and a two-point conversion for a nice little bonus two points. Um, but I think he's a pretty solid play as well if you are looking to stack with Bo Nix. Frank won't be the primary stack. Tez Johnson would be like the pivot or ownership lessening stack. The Wazoo side of things is a little bit of a mess, though. Um, Lincoln Victor is their number one wide receiver. He ended up participating in warmups and then like playing partially against Arizona. And he that's not exactly great. Um, like if you're going to play him, you want him to play a full load of snaps. And if he does play, what he ends up doing is he ends up giving less targets to the other top two wide receivers, Josh Kelly and Kyle Williams. Washington State, when they're at their best, can support three wide receivers being good in fantasy. But the Oregon defense is certainly going to make that tough. The unknown status of Victor is certainly going to make that tough. But if Victor ends up being declared out for this game, Kelly and Williams certainly become in play at a very reasonable price tag, especially in a game that if Washington State keeps it close, it's going to be because Cam Ward's going to be thrown to those two wideouts. Now, the Houston receivers. They're very good. They only play three of them, which is great. It makes it a lot easier to project for fantasy. They pretty much only play Golden, Brown, and Manjack, but I'm not really interested in them in a matchup against Texas where I think all three of them will be super touchdown dependent, and I don't think they're going to score a lot of touchdowns. So if you're looking at game stack it, just take your pick. They all three have pretty similar profiles. They all three kind of alternate who leads in targets and who ends up scoring touchdowns. Um, but I just am not super interested in them outside of a lineup where I might be game stacking the Houston and the Texas side. 
Xavier Worthy for Texas is the clear wide receiver one. He does lead the team in targets. Had a decent day against Oklahoma without scoring a touchdown. He actually hasn't scored a touchdown since week four against Baylor, so it might be time for him to break that TD drought. He's certainly due for one. Adonai Mitchell is Texas wide receiver two, who's kind of tight on the heels of Worthy. Didn't have the best game against Oklahoma, but we've seen him hit his ceiling this season so far with a 32 fantasy point performance against Kansas. I don't mind either Worthy or Mitchell as a, a stackable piece with Quinn Ewers or as a one-off piece in general. General. Jordan Whittington is another one who had a big time performance against Oklahoma with 26 fantasy points without even scoring a touchdown. Um, I think he's an option, but I think that was more of a game plan type play where Quinn Ewers was under more pressure against Oklahoma than he had been all season. And Whittington was kind of the check down option where they could get him the ball in space, let him break a few tackles and make plays off of that. Jatavion Sanders, the tight end, is also in play if he plays. Um, he did not um, play a full game against Oklahoma, um, which is why he only ended up with 2.3 fantasy points. But if he's back in full, he is certainly in play at a very affordable price tag. For Alabama, I'm saying this for like the first time in a while. Jermaine Burton is in play as a wide receiver option. $6,600 on DraftKings. He is their target leader, and he is a big play guy. He's had a reception of over 40 yards in each of the last three games. And so if he gives you a deep touchdown, that's going to be pretty good for you in DFS. He might only need one deep touchdown and then a few other catches to go ahead and hit value, which is a pretty good situation to be in when you're a team's wide receiver one. The Tennessee side of things, though, we know Brew McCoy is out for the season, and we were looking for somebody to step up and dominate the targets last week, and it just really didn't happen. The, you know, they only threw for like 110 passing yards against Texas A&M, so it just was not really a successful passing game. Not a whole lot of information to go off of um, for who's going to be, you know, the beneficiary in this Tennessee receiving room. Squirrel White's probably the best play. He's probably going to lead them in targets. Dante Thornton Jr. is probably the guy that price adjusted might be the best play. Um, he was um, out there against Texas A&M, but he didn't really do anything, didn't end up recording a catch. Um, so I don't really know what to make of the Tennessee situation. It's probably one you can pass on this week and use it as information to see who you're going to play going forward. Now, Oklahoma is what I believe to be a pretty lucrative situation. Andrew Anthony, who was their re leading receiver so far this season, is out for the season um, with an injury. Um, and so that's going to open up more targets for Jaleel Farouk, who was kind of the hero um, against Texas with five catches, 130 yards, and just really, really good after the catch. Um, and I think he's going to be their wide receiver one. I think he's very much in play at $6,300. Drake Stoops is the slot at 6000 I would rather pay up for... Farouk than play Drake Stoops. Um, and then Nick Anderson's probably the guy that's going to be on the field more now that Anthony is out. But Anderson's in a very interesting spot where he is scoring touchdowns at an insane rate. He has 11 catches this season. Six of them are touchdowns. He's like Chris Carter. All he does is score touchdowns. That is a very old reference for most of you watching. Um, and I don't think that this touchdown rate is very sustainable, but if he's going to be on the field more and he's going to be catching passes more, then that might make it sustainable. But the problem is that his price tag is already baked into all the touchdowns that he's scoring. So um, I would prefer him to be a little bit cheaper, but I definitely think he's in play, especially as a guy who might be playing more snaps with the injury to Anthony. Now, the Memphis and the UAB game, we've talked about how stackable this game is, but when you go look at some of these receivers, it becomes even more stackable. Memphis is pretty concentrated. Rock Taylor is a target monster. Um, he's caught at least five passes in each of the last four games. He's scored at least 17 fantasy points in each of the last four games. And he's now in the highest, um, pretty much the most likely to shoot out game on the slate as a number one wide receiver and a team that might be throwing the football more than usual because their running back is hurt. Rock Taylor is in a great spot. And then you've got Demir Blankemsey, who is the slot, who's also getting a lot of targets, scored 18 fantasy points in each of the last two games. But he's more of a short to intermediate target guy. So you're going to need a lot of volume if you want Demir Blankemsey to hit. But it's definitely a possibility because of how concentrated this receiving core is. And then you have UAB side of things where you've got Amari Thomas, who is their wide receiver one at only $5,100 on DraftKings, caught nine passes last week for only 41 yards, which seems almost impossible. Um, I guess he is getting the um, Jarvis Landry treatment in the game plan. But hey, $5,100 for a wide receiver one in a game that's most likely to shoot out on the slate is not a bad spot to be in. And then Tejon Palmer is also there. He's probably their second leading wide receiver, um, second best wide receiver play, I should say. Um, and just two options there for the UAB side of things. Now, for a few one-offs, 
One guy that I really, really like this week is Rashad Owens of Oklahoma State. So since Alan Bowman became the starting quarterback um, in Oklahoma State, Rashad Owens has been great. He had seven targets against Kansas State, had 12 targets against Kansas, um, turned the Kansas one into 23.2 fantasy points without scoring a touchdown. He's been priced up a little bit, but I am okay with that for a guy who's probably going to lead his team in targets in a game environment that might end up being pretty good. And then the last one off that I do want to mention, it's pretty ugly, so, so brace yourself for it. But Iowa, all they do is throw to tight ends. And the new tight end one on the depth chart is Steven Stellanos. Um, you know, Eric All is out for the season. Luke Lachey is out for the season. But Iowa, they throw about half of their passes to the tight end. It's almost like somebody needs to tell Brian Ferentz, like, hey, those guys out there playing wide out, you can throw to them. That's allowed. Um, but, hey, if they're going to keep throwing to the tight end, then why not just play the guy who's having to line up at tight end? And so Steven Stellanos is purely a punt play at $3,100. Um, but I definitely do think it could be a situation where he could end up actually legitimately scoring some fantasy points. Eric All was a pretty good play before he ended up getting hurt for the rest of the season. All right, that does it for this college football DFS preview and pick show. If you like what you saw on YouTube, please hit the like button. Um, it shows me some support, helps the channel out, uh, it helps the videos get noticed. Also subscribe to the channel so you'll be notified when all of our weekly college football, golf, and NFL content drops. And if you need to find more of me, you can follow me on X at Mike's Money Picks. You can join the fantasy corner discord link is in the description and the articles on patreon patreon.com slash mike's money picks all right so that does it for week eight hopefully i was able to give you guys some information that's going to help you find the right plays and help you make some money here in week eight hope to see you again for week nine subscribe to the channel so you can come back for week nine um, and other than that thank you guys for watching and listening and i will see you next time